here are my thoughts from an outsider's perspective on the Watchtower 2022 convention Saturday afternoon video number one. This one starts off with a music video showing various footage of JWs gathering together and doing field service around the world. Then right into another video, this time of a group of people singing in a variety of different languages. Again, no English subtitles as each line is sung in a different language. They just flash the name of the language on the screen as it's constantly changing, which I'm sure is another point of pride about how many languages they know how to translate into and what lockstep uniformity they have around the world. Then on to another music video sung in Swedish this time. So I don't know what the lyrics are about, but it looks like this is supposed to be the story of a guy who JW's witness to and who eventually joins the org and starts attending meetings, decides not to smoke, does field service, and gets baptized. For some reason, they don't show the part where he wakes up, starts asking difficult questions, and ends up getting shunned by all the people that loved him conditionally. Hmm. Next is song number 29 for them to sing. It starts off pretty well with some praise to Jehovah. But then it goes into singing about how great it is to be known as a Jehovah's Witness. It's sad that they think they really represent the true living God because they insist on throwing around the name Jehovah lots. The first talk is from Harold Corsern. The first scripture reference he brings up is Ephesians 4.22, which was just referenced as well in the previous conference video, along with the weird word old personality that they use in the New World Translation. I wonder if any of the JWs noticed that it's used two videos in a row like that. Maybe that's pretty common. I don't watch enough of these to know for sure, but I do know that they like to only focus in again and again on the same proof text instead of walking through scripture as a whole book by book, verse by verse. He gives a list of old personality traits that JWs need to put away, even though they're not born again and therefore do not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to sanctify them. Does it make them feel peace to be reminded of all this impossible work they're told to do? He has a list of peace wreckers to discuss. The first one is that inappropriate boasting is bad, so you shouldn't do it. Now, I agree that pride is a sin, of course. But I wonder if what he's basically communicating is that you should never boast in yourself and instead just boast in the organization, which they are definitely encouraged to do. That really reinforces their requirement to give up all individuality and just become a number in the org, doesn't it? After he spent some time talking about why boasting is wrong, we see a video dramatization to further press the point, though it's about a JW woman who makes videos about her jewelry and how another JW mistakes that for boasting. It's kind of a weird video to use to make this point, since this is supposed to be about someone being mistaken as boasting. Wouldn't that only end up being confusing for the average JW, making them second guess many things they do every day and wondering if it too will be seen as boasting? Then he quotes several proof texts and actually didn't do a terrible job with those, so long as you take them for what they are really saying, which is that Christians are to boast in Yahweh himself, who he is and what he has done, not in ourselves and certainly not in an organization. So he ends up missing the mark there, and I'm sure that has to be because he wants JWs to be boasting in the org and really how proud they all are to belong to it. And I have most definitely seen pictures and videos of JWs showing off their JW pride. I've heard the boasting about how they're the only ones, supposedly, who go door to door, who use the word kingdom and say the name Jehovah. I'm sure you've heard that a lot too. This is exactly what he goes on to encourage JWs to do when he says to boast about your fellow workers. Even when he talks about boasting in Jehovah, he redefines that to sound more like boasting in the organization than Jehovah himself. And he suggests that this is how they will preserve their peace with Jehovah and their brothers. 
Again, nothing about the peace with God that Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross, or stake if you prefer. And that's really the heart of it, isn't it? It's all about how you have to work, 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 not the finished work of Christ for sinners. But real peace with God is permanent. It's eternal. It's a gift from the one who has the power to give it. It's not a temporary experience or feeling that may flee as soon as I fail to live up to it in some way. No, it's very real. But JWs can't know that peace until they repent and turn to Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Next up is Brother Seth Hyatt to explain to us what the word envy means, just in case we don't already know. That's more of the gaslighting, isn't it? After giving us a definition of envy, he tries to use an example from the Bible saying that the religious leaders envied Jesus because he was so well liked. In fact, they hated Jesus for proclaiming himself to be God in a variety of ways, like forgiving sins, for instance. They are clear as to why they hate Jesus, as they kept responding to him with the accusation of blasphemy. And if he wasn't in fact God incarnate, they would have been correct. But blaming their envy instead for the persecution and execution of Jesus is a subtle and effective way to keep JWs from considering this. But hey, he said the name Jesus, right? That doesn't happen too often in these videos. From there, he uses Joseph's brothers as an example of envy, just in case you're still not getting it. And then he goes on to Korah's rebellion. Again, this one gets twisted in a disturbing way. He talks about how Korah was envious of Moses' position as God's representative. And then how Jehovah destroyed him and his supporters, disrupted the peace of the Israelite congregation for a time. You don't want to disrupt the peace in your congregation by ever questioning your leaders, right? That's the point they seem to be making. This twist is clearly designed to coerce JWs to stay in line no matter what. And next is a video dramatization to try and drive the point home. I have to wonder if the fact that the woman in the video is envious of something she sees on her phone is a subtle way of reminding JWs to stay off social media, lest they encounter an apostate or any information that might make them start questioning the org, thus disturbing their peace. Next, he makes a point of defining humility and also egotism, just in case you have never heard of those things before. He's right that humility is a good thing. But here, he just tells JWs that they should just be humble, which fits into their whole change your own personality category. Christians are called to be humble, but how we can do that is by the work of the Holy Spirit as we are reminded through the scriptures again and again what wicked, wretched sinners we are and what this amazing God has done to save us. That is humbling. It's not something we do like turning a light switch on or off. It's God's work in us by his mercy and grace. But you won't see that discussed by cult leaders, will you? Next, we're on to Brother Gaius Glocantine, who tells us what dishonesty means and why you should avoid it. I can already see why Jeffrey Jackson was not selected to do this part of the talk. <laughs> Brother Gaius then uses the powerful and popular analogy of a virus to tell us how bad dishonesty is. Sounds like something to kind of be terrified of, hey? And then we get back to how this too will destroy the peace in the congregation. This is just mind numbing stuff. Do you need to be told what dishonesty is and why it's a bad thing for you to engage in? Yeah, I didn't think so. Then comes the next part of the same video where the woman was being envious of someone else. Now she's being dishonest about her conversation with her friend. That's a naughty JW. Also, do you remember the last time that you were so envious of someone that you were so dramatically upset and unable to let it go? They're really stretching with these dramatizations, and I can see why. The subject matter is so basic and simple that they're totally unnecessary. It looks to me more like fluff to fill time. After dissecting the video, Brother Gaius brings us back to Ephesians 4, which seems to keep coming up in these videos. 
this time to remind us how dishonesty disrupts the peace with the congregation. And now we're on to Brother Patrick LaFranca to tell us what gossip is and why it's bad. It's interesting they define it as harmful gossip, as if there is any kind of gossip that is ever not harmful. (laughs) He starts off by saying that sharing any news about someone else is always gossip. Do JWs believe this? I get that there certainly are times, like for instance, when praying in a small group and mentioning someone for prayers can sometimes in fact be gossip. And we should all be careful not to do that. The intention can be wrong and yes, it happens. But sharing information is not automatically gossip. Sometimes it's just sharing important information that needs to be shared. So I don't know what he thinks he's doing here. I have heard that gossip is a huge problem at Kingdom Halls, so maybe it's related to that, like kind of chastising the kids for misbehaving. Looking at his proof text and a story he shared, this fellow also seems to have gossip confused with slander. The thing is, while slander is always gossip, gossip is not always slander. It can be true, but just inappropriate to share or shared with wrong motives. He seems to kind of miss that point. Maybe that's because they don't really seem to ever talk about sin as a heart issue that it really is. Then we get into a video about the husband of the bad JW woman spreading the same comments she had as gossip about the woman who posted on social media. His elder pulls him aside and gives him a proof text to stop doing it. I know I've said it before, but this all feels very much like an after school special. (laughs) Are JWs really wowed by this stuff? Brother Patrick then dissects the video and gives several other super simple basic reasons why gossip is bad, along with a few proof texts. Again, much of what he's saying isn't wrong, it's just so very, very simple that it has to be more related to their gaslighting than anything else. Am I wrong? Do you think this is really the first time the average JW has heard why gossip may be a bad thing? I don't think any of this is earth shattering for any of them. At least, I hope not. Sadly, he doesn't bring it all around to the gospel, of course, which is the answer for our sinful ways. It's all about working to earn friendship with Jehovah, not living a transformed life by the power and grace of God because of what he has done for his children. So sad. And now on to Kenneth Cook to tell us what uncontrolled anger is and why it's bad, citing studies, medical details, and of course, some proof texts. His talk is essentially pure pragmatism with no gospel. Yes, uncontrolled anger is indeed a sin, but he has no real solution other than to chastise the followers for it and warn them to not be like that. Right off the bat, he's telling us how uncontrolled anger is Satan's anger. It sounds to me like he's already blaming Satan for it, just like Eve did in the garden. Instead of pointing out how sin is a heart issue that we are each personally responsible for. That would be too much bad news that would need the good news that they don't ever share. And just in case you're still not understanding how bad uncontrolled anger is, we get another video dramatization to really drive the point home. This time, we have the woman who was envious of another JW because of her social media post and whose husband later gossiped about it. Now, she's trying to confront the woman about her post, when this woman was already stressed out and having a bad day. So, she has a bit of a fit and walks away. Now we get Brother Kenneth to dissect the scene in case you still aren't getting it. I found it interesting that he tells his followers that it's important to control your anger by avoiding bad association because they might poison you into expressing your anger uncontrollably. I've heard and read enough from this organization to recognize he's using this to encourage the shunning practice, reminding them that they're supposed to believe all so-called apostates are sinful, horrible people. And of course, there's another Armageddon plug to remind everyone to keep living in fear And then a reminder to keep working hard to earn Jehovah's approval. Next, we're on to part one of a Watchtower documentary, which starts off with various political leaders talking about peace, followed by footage of war and unrest. 
I can already see where this is going to go. People love wicked government who claim to offer peace. But if you really want peace, you should follow the watchtower instead. They do a bit of a summary of the book of Jonah, complete with dramatization and some subpar acting. It looks like this is the same video they presented at a previous convention. It's fascinating to me how they use Jonah as someone to look up to and emulate because he trusted Jehovah. In fact, Jonah hated Nineveh and didn't want them to be spared, which is at least one of the reasons why he didn't want to preach repentance to them and see them be saved. They kind of skip the end of the book where Jonah is still upset that they were spared. Yes, he did ultimately obey God and God used that for his purposes, but he was not a peaceful, happy, faithful prophet by any means. He was a sinful fallen man who God mercifully used. I've noticed that Watchtower loves to talk about various people in the Old Testament as if they're heroes that we should strive to be like. They miss the point pretty much every time. Next they move on to King Hezekiah, who was a faithful king for much of his life, though he really messed up near the end of his life. But again, Watchtower props him up as a hero to be a model for JWs to live like. And again, this dramatization is so cringy. I wonder if JWs think that too. I'll bet many of them do. Of course, they try to compare God saving his people in Hezekiah's day to also saving the JWs at Armageddon. Basically, Jehovah saved Hezekiah because he was good. So if you are good enough, he will save you too. Eventually, they go on to talk about Josiah and how he had the idols destroyed in the land. Again, you can hear that subtle comparison to how JWs are required to stand for what they call the truth, even when the world doesn't like them. I'm actually surprised that Russia doesn't come up at some point in this, this part of the talk. Then they fast forward to Daniel and how faithful he was. It's interesting how Daniel was indeed faithful as a government official throughout his life. JWs find that detestable, but never seem to consider this about him. Can you imagine a JW as a government official? Yeah, me neither. I do wonder if JWs ever think about this issue, or if it's something they just put on the shelf in their minds and try to ignore. I don't think I've seen the whole Daniel video before, but I'm guessing many have commented previously how very, very white the actor is that they cast in the Daniel role. I find that pretty funny. Of course, you have to expect they will insert the Watchtower's made-up dates instead of the historical dates of these events because they're still clinging to 607 in 1914 and all that, which Charles Taze Russell came up with from his days of pyramidology. The artistic license they use in this video is pretty disturbing at times. When they're commenting on the video, they suggest that this is what happened as if it's just that Daniel had enough faith, so Jehovah took care of him. And also, of course, they talk about his reading the prophets and the rest of available scripture that he could. Which, you know, I'm quite sure he actually did. But I think they're using this to promote things like taking in knowledge and reading the literature of the day, just like JWs are required to do with all the Watchtower publications. Daniel did it, so you should too, right? Daniel certainly did have faith, but is that the point of the story? Might it not instead be God working in all of this, both providentially and miraculously, that is really the main point? I understand that JWs are taught to basically reject miracles, certainly in our day and age. So maybe that's why they do this? I don't know. They really make it all sound wooden and pretty ridiculous. And the way they all present this whole thing really makes me wonder if any of them have ever read the book of Daniel for themselves. We know Watchtower discourages this, so yeah, maybe not. Finally, as we get to the end of this video, we have several men basically saying that it's all about how Jehovah will come through for you if you just have enough faith. Again, it's not about Jehovah, it's really about you and what work you can do to get what you want whether that be help when you're having a bad day, or of course, surviving Armageddon, which is coming any day now. And 
Of course, they could not resist bringing up the Watchtower's twist on Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the interpretation Daniel clearly gives to suggesting that it's being fulfilled right now and proves Armageddon is right around the corner, just like they've been saying for the last 150 years or so. Finally, they finish with song number 130, which tells you all the things you can do to earn Jehovah's forgiveness via the ransom, of course. Okay, that's it for this one. One more video left to go.